Hey everyone, it's Ricky with Everyday Woodworking, your podcast home for tips, tricks, and information on how to make the most of your woodworking time and money every day. Well, today we are doing something a little different. Uh, a little different. If you're a regular listener, then you know we've been in the middle of a setting up your small shop series. Uh, but today we're going to take a little bit of a break from that and we're going to do a little listener Q&A. I'm very excited about this. Um, also, you may know we post episodes every week here on Everyday Woodworking. Well, last week we skipped a week and that's something we haven't done before. But we skipped a week just between, frankly, between Easter and our woodworking orders, which are kind of backed up right now, uh, and just family stuff. We just didn't have time to get it all together. So uh, so we skipped a week. Uh, and if you missed us, we missed you. Um, but we're back. We're back. Um, so I'm not one to beat around the bush. I want to uh, really jump right on into this with our questions. Uh, but a couple of things first. Uh, one, if you have questions for us uh, that you'd like for us to answer in our next Q&A, uh, then please send them on to me. Um, you can email them to me at Ricky, that's R-I-C-K-Y, Ricky at, and then was, I mean, let me say this, I hate it when people spell my name R-I-C-K-I or I-E, I'm not a girl. I know, I know I'm pretty, I know, but I'm not, my name is Ricky, like Ricky Ricardo, okay, R-I-C-K-Y, my email address is R-I-C-K-Y, Ricky at applevalleyfarmga.com, and really, now it can be any kind of question you want to send, I mean, you know, any kind of a woodworking question, you want to send. It's, you know, anything goes. Uh, let's just, let's see. Let's see where this thing goes. I think it'll be a lot of fun. Second thing, before we get started, I am drinking my coffee. As always, from my J. Moore Farms Cup. And I know you guys have seen me before with my J. Moore Farms Cup. I just wanted to revisit this and remind you guys about J. Moore Farms. J. Moore has been our local destination for fresh fruits and vegetables, handmade products, and frankly, hands down, the most down-to-earth staff and service of any business that we deal with. They are just fantastic. Plus, they're only they're one of only a handful of retailers that we trust enough with our handmade woodworking products um, at Apple Valley Farm, like our carpenter bee traps. So they're one of the very few people that we let actually carry our stuff out in or in a retail setting. We've been dealing with Jay Moore as customers for years, uh, both at the Alto Georgia store and now more recently down here closer to home at the Banks Crossing store in Commerce. Uh, but if you have not given them a try yet, you're missing out. You definitely need to stop in if you're local, either at Alto or at Commerce. Uh, but if you're not local, that's okay. You can go online and visit them at jmorefarms.com. That's J-A-E-M-O-R Farms. J-Moore Farms. Spelled kind of funny, but it's it's pretty simple. So thank you, J-Moore. Thank you, Daphne. Uh, and all of the staff over at Jay Moore for taking care of us. As always, you guys rock for hooking us up with this amazing coffee mug. Thank you uh, for everything y'all do. Alrighty, with that, let's get this party started. Alrighty, getting into our Q and A. Uh, FYI. I'm going to be pulling these questions not only from email, uh, also, also, also from podcast comments, social media, and from our YouTube channel. Uh, so this is really going to cover a wide range of stuff. The first question is from, again, this is a guy that's, that's a friend of ours anyway, and I have to say, 
David, I was a little nervous when I saw that you were submitting a question because my initial reaction was number one was, oh no, you know he's gonna he's he's testing me uh, because David uh, is a very knowledgeable, uh, experienced woodworker. I'm not. <laughs> In comparison, I'm I'm not. So I'm usually going to him and asking him for advice or he's giving me instruction. So anyway, when I saw that David was submitting the question, I was pretty excited. So anyway, this is from David Boardman at Boardman Company Woodworks uh, and from Facebook. And if you want to find David on Facebook, he's at, at Boardman CO Woodworks. Uh, David's question is a simple one. It is, house shoes or Crocs in the shop? I don't know. Where did, David, where did you come up with this? I was expecting like some legit woodworking question. But nevertheless, we got it. House shoes or Crocs in the shop? Okay. First, I, I would have to say, um, we have to figure out, number one, is David trying to be funny here or is he serious? I mean, because, you know, could be serious. It, it depends on how redneck he is, right? Because he could be serious. He could be wanting to wear house shoes in the shop. I don't know. Uh, secondly, and then in, in relation to that, I have to figure out, what is a house shoe? I know what Crocs are, right? Um, and I think we all know that Crocs in the shop is probably inviting pain and suffering. Uh, I probably wouldn't wear Crocs in the shop, but let's investigate this. Let's let's go see how far this rabbit hole goes, okay? I would say the first thing I need to do is figure out a definition for house shoes. Okay. For me, in my head, I'm thinking house shoes is like any commonly worn style of comfortable shoe, uh, like one that's worn around the house. Okay. Now that could be relative also because my definition of comfortable and your definition of comfortable may be something else. But generally speaking, any commonly worn, comfortable shoe that would be worn around the house. Okay, Google says, a little more specifically, a house shoe is a general term for any footwear that is intended to be worn indoors, particularly at home. I don't know if I agree with that completely, but it goes on to say, a slipper, for example, is a type of indoor footwear, but also could be an outdoor footwear that you can easily slip on your feet. Remember that house shoes can be slippers, but not all slippers can be house shoes. And that would be true. Um, a croc would be technically a slipper, but it wouldn't be considered a house shoe. For me, a house shoe is something I would call, we call it a bedroom slipper or a bedroom shoe. Um, and I think you know what I'm talking about. If you don't know what, uh, a bedroom shoe is, <laughs> a bedroom shoe is what a redneck woman wears to Walmart. All right, there you go. It's it's out. I said it. There we go. I said it and I'm I'm I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm not taking it back. A redneck shoe, uh, no, redneck. <laughs> now I'm lost. A house shoe is what a redneck woman wears to Walmart, and you know what I'm talking about. Number one, if you've ever been to Walmart after 1 a.m., you know exactly what I'm talking about, Jack. But depending on your locale, it doesn't have to be after 1 a.m. for you to experience what I'm talking about. You know what I mean. When you see a woman coming into Walmart in her pajama pants and these pink, fuzzy, something-y shoes, 
things on her feet. Those are bedroom shoes. That's what I call, that's what I call a house shoe, okay? Redneck woman footwear. That's what it is. So I know, I know David knows what I'm talking about. And David, I would actually, I would be curious to see you wearing some house shoes like that. I think, uh, I think some pink glittery, the more glitter, the better. I think some pink, pink glittery, furry shoes, maybe even some unicorn colored shoes. I think that would be great, uh, just to give it a try. Uh, but anyway, so back to my comparison between the two. So I would say, in in response to David's question, which one is better in the shop? I would say it depends on the work you're going to be doing. Because if you're going to be sanding versus... Um, planing. I would say those would require different footwear choices, okay? Um, however, we should note that neither of these are OSHA approved or MAMA approved. Um, and if you wear either one of those in the shop, you're probably playing with, with fire. And you're probably going to run across something that's not very agreeable with, with your foot. But Crocs... Interestingly, interestingly enough, I would say Crocs have some stuff going for them. They have a harder sole, usually, than a house shoe would. So that would be better protection against nails and brads and screws and sharp, pointy stuff that might want to snag the bottom of your foot. Nevertheless, Crocs aren't exactly open-toed, but they are holy-toed. What a stupid term. Why did I say... Uh, okay. They are holy toad. Um, <laughs> we thought you was a toad. We, uh... I, I, I would say Crocs are holy toad. They're not completely enclosed like a house shoe. And that could be problematic depending on the application, depending on the environment that you're in. So... House shoes, while they're not structurally protective, they are at least completely enclosed. Uh, but Crocs would be more structurally protective. I, I would say, I would have to say, David, if it was me, I would go with the house shoe. Again, it depends on what kind of work you're doing. But I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with a house shoe. And look, so, I'm gonna show you. so this is this is what I'm wearing right now. This is my house shoe. You see, and there, there's no, there's not much protection in this, but m the whole front of my foot is covered. So that's that's what I'm going with right there. I'm going with the house shoe. All right, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you, David, for that thought-provoking question. Thank you so much. That'll go down in the annals of history as, as one of the great woodworking questions. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next question is from our YouTube channel. <clears throat> this is from Don Palm, P-A-L-M, Don Palm. Is it just me? So when I see Don's name, if, he's, if his last name is Palm, he, sure, he must live on the ocean, wouldn't you think? He lives either in Florida or in California. He has to, with a name like Palm. Surely, with a name like Palm, he doesn't live in Kansas, you know? That would be odd. Would that be? Anyway, anyway I'm, I'm off. Anyway, this is from Don Palm. He said, I just bought a set of unfinished cornhole boards, and someone told me to wet sand the final sanding. What's your opinion on that? Okay, let me just go ahead and say, um, when I hear the term wet sanding, to me, that applies to auto body work, okay? Because 
with, with my real limited experience with it, when we would wet sand something, we would have the hose pipe up here with the constant water running and then sanding the whole time while water's running. I assume to wash away the finest of particles um, before we apply the paint. So that's what I'm assuming wet sanding, uh, the intention of wet sanding is. You don't want to be wet sanding a piece of wood. But having said that, I get it. I, I think I understand what this person is suggesting. And so Don, if I, if I understand them correctly, they're suggesting something that we call raising the grain. And I don't know if you're familiar with this term or not. Let me see if I can explain. So raising the grain is an essential, in my opinion, it's an essential step for fine woodworking, but I think it's an essential step for most woodworking, regardless of whether it's fine or not. Um, it's not wet sanding, but it does involve some water, um, which seems to be so odd with a piece of wood, but and let me see if I can explain. Um, the water raises, it causes the surface wood fibers to absorb uh, moisture and swell. And when they do, um, it creates a very noticeable um, less smooth surface. So when they get wet, they pull that moisture in and then that texture gets really rough, okay? And it creates little ridges uh, there on the wood. Now, then you go back and you sand those ridges off and then the ability of those fibers to continue to swell is reduced. So, when you put your your stain or your paint or whatever or your your finished product on the wood, the moisture in that product is going to cause the grain. It's going to want to raise the grain on its own. Well, if you're putting your final finish on there, and then you raise the grain, well, then you're kind of screwed because then you can't sand that stuff back down again. You want to do that before you put your poly on there right? That makes sense, right? So you want to, this is what I do. I would sand the wood down with like a 150 or 220 if you got it. Uh, that would be my choice. Sand it down really smooth, brush it, uh, blow it off, or at least uh, brush it off uh, really, really well. Then take a uh, spray bottle with just regular old water in it and coat it. And you don't have to put a lot on there, but you know, put some water on it. Let it sit for a few minutes. And what it's going to do is this, those wood fibers are going to absorb some of that moisture and they're going to swell up. And when you run your hand across it, you're going to, you're going to feel a noticeable difference. Give it a few minutes, let it dry. Take your sandpaper, the 220. You don't have to do it really hard, but give it a good sanding. It will knock off those little ridges and you'll have a really smooth surface again. For me, I would do that process two or three times. Two or three times after that, those surface fibers are going to be reduced to the point to where they're not going to create a textured surface anymore. And so that way, when you put your finished product on there, the moisture in it won't cause an imperfect surface. Does that make sense? That's what I would do. And I believe that's what this person is talking about when they say, you know, to wet sand the final sanding. That is definitely uh, what I would do. You, you don't have to do it, but if you don't, you're going to feel a noticeable difference um, in the final product. So... Anyway, hey, Don, I hope that helps in Florida or wherever you, you're from, <laughs> okay? Uh, and I'm just kidding about your name. All right. This is from, next question is from Justin G. Justin's here on Facebook. Now, Justin, I don't know. I'm terrible with genealogy once we get past first cousin. 
I don't, Justin, I don't know what we are. What we are, you're, a, we are cousins, but I don't know what cousins. Anyway, Justin's in my family. We're in family tree together, um, but I don't know exactly what we are to each other. But anyway, this is from from my cousin. Uh, this is from Justin G. And this is a good question. Actually, this was my favorite question of everything that was asked. Justin said, <clears throat> which wood finishing product and technique do you like the most and why? Great question. And I, I'll have to say, when I read this, I knew like that. I knew what my, my answer would be. Um, we have done a lot of uh, finishing stuff over the years, but I knew exactly uh, what my favorite product and my favorite technique would be as soon as I read this. When we started Apple Valley Farm, it's been uh, almost six years. Can you believe six years? Wow. Almost six years ago. Um, I fell in love with spar urethane, and people that know me know Ricky was like obsessed with it. I wouldn't say I talk about it all the time now, but I do love it. It is still my favorite product. Just, I mean, I love, I love the smell of it. I love the consistency of it. I love the way it affects a piece of wood. It's just a remarkable product. And, uh, I love to use it. It can be a pain in the butt if, you don't use it correctly because um, it doesn't like humidity. It doesn't like low or high temperatures. It's prone to bubble. Um, and it does, as I said, it does change the color uh, of whatever you're using on. But, Jack, I love it. I just do. Uh, back when we used to do uh, almost exclusively heart pine stuff, I found out really quick how the spar affected the heart pine and it was just right up my alley. So, uh, it, there's nothing else like it and, and I love it. Uh, it will always be my favorite product. My favorite technique would have to be, and I don't even know if I'm saying this right. Um, shows, show Sugi band, probably show, show Sugi bond. Is probably how, probably more technically correct, but it's burning wood. Um, but Shoshu, Sho, I want to say Shoshugi, Shoshugi, Shosugi ban. And uh, it's the burning of wood to seal the surface of it uh, and protect it. It seems so weird, right? But I love doing it. I love doing it. The first time I heard about it, uh, I was watching an episode of Fixer Upper. And Chip, uh, what's his name? Chip Gaines was uh, also learning about it. And he was amazed, you know, at it. And I was amazed. The fact that you could burn this wood and, and create this natural protective barrier, it was just amazing to me. And, and I loved it. You, you don't really burn the wood. You... You char the surface and it kind of caramelizes those outer fibers and then it makes them less porous. So it's it's just a great natural process for protecting the wood and it works and it's so cool. And, and a few years ago, it was uh, really, really trendy. It's not so much now. I'm, well, no, I shouldn't say that. It's not as trendy as it was, but it is still very popular, and and I'm glad for that. So, um, I hope I get to keep you know burn, burning wood for a long time. Uh, I like doing it, and I love the spar urethane. So those are my two things, Justin. That was that was a great question. Uh, I I I appreciate that. So one last question here before I wrap this up. Uh, this is back from our YouTube channel uh, from Cindy Beckwith. Cindy says, do you put any kind of sealer on your wood before or after painting your lettering? Now, um, so let me explain. In case you, you don't know, um, one of the 
the biggest things Apple Valley Farm, our woodworking business does, is we hand letter uh, signs and decor and stuff like that. That's we've that we've always done that, and that's the biggest part of our business is our hand lettering. Um, so we do that, and I, a lot of times I'll uh, post a video on our YouTube channel of me doing it, so people can see how I do it. And so that's what Cindy's referring to here is one of those videos. So Cindy, the an the short answer is no. Um, I don't put any kind of sealer on the wood. But when we do, um, it's not before I paint, but it's after. Um, if I do put it on there, um, then it's a it's just a clear matte finish. And I used to do that on every sign we did until I just found out it was overkill. It it doesn't really need it. Unless it's going to be in an environment where it's going to be being touched or, you know, high traffic environment, something like that, um, then it would need some protection on it. Um, but we don't, we don't hardly ever do it anymore. Um, as far as doing it before, I've never done that. I'm vaguely familiar with it. And I think you can get something that's called like wood conditioner. I uh, maybe, maybe something like that. Um, and I think what the wood conditioner does is, um, it helps seal the wood a little bit so that it's, um, it's not as prone to, to soak up moisture. And <clears throat> so let me see if I can explain. If you go get a freshly planed new piece of wood, it feels like glass, man. And, you know, if you put it even, if you put a drop of water on there, initially it's just going to beat up like it's on glass. Um, if you get an old piece of wood that's really well worn and the fibers are, are really exposed and it's porous, you put water on there, it's just going to soak in like it's a sponge. That's what happens when you paint on that old wood. Um, and the, the craft paint that most of us use is very, is water-based and it has um, a very high water content in it. The cheaper the paint, the higher the water content is. That's why it's so cheap because they dilute the pigment so much. I happen to, I happen to like it uh, because it flows very easily and it works well for me when I'm lettering. However, if I'm working with a piece of older porous wood, I opt, I usually opt for a better paint with a lower water content, and then it's much less likely to bleed. Because what happens when you use that cheap paint on that old porous wood, then you can see outside of your brush stroke, you can see the wood absorbing water. And that's just what it's doing. So I believe that's why Cindy is asking this about sealing the wood before I paint or letter. And and some people will say that's an essential step, that you have to seal the wood. No, you don't. We have never done it. And I've painted thousands of signs with thousands of satisfied customers, and we've never done it. You can do it. Uh, and it will help, but you don't have to do it. So that's my suggestion right there. I will say this too. If you're going to have a sign that's going to be going outdoors, um, then you will want to put something on it, but not just a clear matte finish. You'll want to put uh, maybe some spray on polyurethane on it. And I will say this, and but, and this is a big but, no matter what you put on it, that sign's gonna, not going to be weatherproof. It's going to be weather resistant. So you can put it outside on your porch, but I would not want to like put it outside in your yard because it's just not going to last. There's a specific 
process for making a sign that's weatherproof, and I'm not going to get into it within the scope of this, um, but what we're doing, what we're talking about here, where you're lettering with acrylic water-based paint on a piece of wood and then spraying something to seal it on the top of it, it's, that's not going to be weatherproof. It's just going to be resistant to some moisture. So anyway, um, I hope that helps. Okay, that's, um, wow, that went fast. And that was 30 minutes. How did that happen? Anyway, that was, uh, that was a lot of fun. I like it. Um, I like this Q&A format. So I think I want to do this some more. We might do this like, I don't know, maybe once a month or something. Let's just see. We'll see. Um, it depends on the questions we get, uh, how many questions we get, stuff like that. So, uh, hey, if y'all got stuff you want to know, send it in. Let me, uh, let me know. Uh, let me know what you want to know, and we'll see if we can work it in, and we'll see if we can maybe just make this a regular segment. That'd be really cool. Okay, we're done. Wow, that was quick. Okay, uh, one last thing, though. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, um, uh, if you're listening to the podcast, definitely leave us, leave us a great review wherever you're, you're listening, especially if it's on Apple podcast and wherever you're listening, uh, subscribe to our podcast and become a regular listener. We would love to have you, uh, as a, a regular listener and hear us every week. Uh, that would be great. Uh, also, if you're watching this on YouTube, then obviously, we try to post a video of each podcast episode here on our YouTube uh, channel, our woodworking channel. And uh, so definitely like, comment, and subscribe to that YouTube channel if you want to see more like this and all kinds of woodworking videos and how-to and shop tips and yada yada and stuff like that. And finally, if you'd like to learn even more about us, you can always visit us on our website uh, where we're going to have things like our shop notes, uh, blog, recipes, uh, woodworking ideas, uh, woodworking plans, yada yada, stuff like that. So please check us out over at www.applevalleyfarmga.com. We would love to have you over there. Bam! That's it. That is it. Hey guys, thank you so much. Thank you very much for being here. I hope you learned something from this. Um, hope you have a great day, and I can't wait to see you again next time. We'll see you next week right here on Everyday Woodworking. Take care.